Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going into the best city kit that I've ever seen for an RPG. Uh, for any RPG game, really. I mean, this is system neutral, so it works for anything. This is Into the Cess and Citadel by Alex Coogan or Coggan and Charlie Fergus Navery. This 288 page document is incredible. Now, if you saw my last review, uh, or yeah, the, the review on the End of the Weird and Wild, you'll get a sense of what this book is, because it's the same idea. But instead of the wilderness, this is a city. So it, it's, it's definitely going for a specific tone. Now the cover is actually, I mean, it's bright pink and it really uh, catches your attention, but the book itself doesn't quite have that sort of uh, brightness to it. It is really dark and grim, but not quite as horror, or I would say horrific, as Into the Weird and Wild. It is definitely more, um, well, the tone is just different. Because you're in a city, the sort of horror that you can get into is different. Um, it's much more political. It's much more based on uh, sort of this oppression and a sense of, like, desperation, um, a sense of kind of, you know, the dangers that are out of your control, but rather than sort of these wild, random things that can happen to you in the wilderness, one of the things that this book makes clear is that the dangers in the city are reactive, which is an interesting difference. I really like the philosophy that goes into this book. So I'll go through it and we'll talk about, um, you know, just what, what's going on here and what you, can, uh, what, you can, what you can get if you get this book. I really highly recommend it. Now, the art in this book is great. It's mostly done in one's particular style, this sketchy style that's a little bit like Into the Weird and Wild, but it's a little bit more ridiculous, I would say, most of the time than Into the Weird and Wild. Into the Weird and Wild is bizarre, and if there's whimsy, it's like really buried deep down and it's mostly creepy. This is often as whimsical as it is creepy, and so it has just a different overall vibe. But I love this book. I think it's great. I'm, I'm really partial to urban campaigns. I've, I've always wanted to run a really, really long, big, like, urban campaign set in one big city. And this book makes me more inclined to do so because of the great tools that it has in it. Now, the recommended systems here, you can see your Dungeon Crawl Classics, uh, Old School Essentials, you know, um, but, but also includes things like Pathfinder and D&D 5e. This is a system-neutral game. The tone would fit really well with DCC, but overall, it, it can go with any game. Absolutely. If I were to play this, I'd do it for Shadow Dark, probably, or Old School Essentials. System neutral and what that means with some um, advice on how to transition into the different kinds of systems you might have, like roll over, roll under systems, that sort of thing. A brief introduction that kind of gets you in the mood for this city, and one of the things I love is the, is the last little quote there. This city eats people. Never forget that. It's great. There's this idea that behind everything in the city is a will. There's this creature, the mighty worm, that lives beneath or within the city, and it drives this sort of evil and corruption and madness that is sort of fueling the city. And it, so, so the city itself is sort of a neutral place. I mean, what I mean is that it's like it's uh, setting neutral, right? There's, there's suggestions and there, there are like different districts that are presented, but they're presented in sort of like a suggested way. Here is a district you could have, and here are some people who are there, and here are some factions and some tables for what they might want. But then there are some specifics given to give you, like, okay, here's one, right? So there's a faction with particular characters and a particular district with different things there. So again, lots of tables for you to roll on, but then some specifics if you just want to take and, and you know, plug and play, as it were. Or what is this? What is the book? What is it for? The contents and goals. It's great to have this early on, just an introduction to the book. You get it clearly, so that way you know exactly what you're getting into. Throughout the book, there are these cool uh, sketches of the city, and then there's like these coiling, you know, this coiling worm in the background. You can never really see the whole thing, but it's always there. I like that a lot throughout the book. Rules of the street. So these are a bunch of additional rules you can get here uh, within the Sesson Citadel, Citadel, the toy box method, right? It's, you can, these are modular. You can drop in and play, or you can use it how you want. Uh, this is a different style of art here. It's much more, uh, I would say it's much less, right, this is, this is much less gloomy, it's much less sketchy. It gives you much more of like a cartoony feel. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Um, these characters show up again and again in the art throughout this book. And it, but it contributes, I would say, it contributes to a tone that is different than Into the Weird and Wild. It, it's still consistent with DCC, but it's a different kind of DCC, I would say. Uh, so. Yeah, you know, some people are going to really like this slight change. Some people are going to really not like it. They'll prefer the weird and wild. 
Um, but that might come down to just, you know, preference and tone. Traveling the city, rules for traveling the city. I really like this, right? If it's congested or dangerous in the average travel time. And then uh, you can expedite travel if you wanna, you know, take a shortcut or you can pay. But otherwise, you know, you're gonna have to crawl through the streets of the city. And that's what I really like about both this book and Into the Weird and Wild, is it takes what can often just be sort of like a side thing, right? The path through the wilderness and into the weird and wild, or this one, uh, into the Sesson Citadel, city travel, which is often just like, okay, you get there. And it it takes the, um, the sort of procedures that you often get in old school games for dungeons, and it applies it to other things. So in this case, it's like, okay, we're going to turn the city into a dungeon. How do we do that? Well, we make travel more interesting. We make, the, you know, there be choices you have to make there. And, 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 and as you'll see, there's a lot of good rules for this whole process, right? How <laughs> different ways of short, uh, sh getting shortcuts, right? Roof hopping, street running, sewer creeping. They're different choices. Okay, we, well, we gotta get there quickly. Well, let's take one of these options. Let's try to get across the roofs. Let's try to go you know, through the streets and run through them going to back alleys, all that stuff, or uh, sewer creeping. And then there are going to be checks that you can make to do that, and then hazards that can happen as a result of failing. That's really great. And then you get traffic and crowds. So as you're running through the city, what's the cause of the traffic? What's the size of the event, the atmosphere and mood of the crowd, etc. So again, great tables for generating um, hazards and opposition to the movement through the streets. It makes that very action interesting and, and full of choices. You don't, you're not just doing interesting things in the locations, but in between the locations. Cobblestone encounters. So if you run into people on the street like beggars or muggers or aristocrats, right, or magisters, you got really brief, simple stat blocks here, along with what happens if you are mugged or if during one of these encounters these things happen to you, you are considered to be mugged. And mugged is a technical term and it results in a technical thing. Um, so if, if you are wounded in retreat, if you're knocked unconscious or if you're unwillingly robbed, something bad happens to you beyond that action different encounters and what they might want. How to rough it, right, if you if you don't have any money or you can't find a place to stay, well, there's some rules for that. The same thing with if you need to eat, because you're gonna have to eat, uh, and you don't have enough money, you can't find a good place to eat, you can go dumpster diving, basically, right? <laughs> but you gotta be careful because you can get really sick and and really, really harm yourself if you don't, uh, if you're not careful. Everything has its price. And I really like these, these tables. You have hirelings and services, clothing, and then we'll see other goods on the next pages. But it breaks it down into four kinds. Common, middling, wealthy, and opulent. And, you know, there are some rules for those things, but there are also, you know, it's just up to you. Very often in RPGs, you don't have a lot to spend your money on. That's one of the problems I've found, especially in 5th edition, say, but other games too, is that I, I don't know what to spend my money on. Well, here's a great... Uh, way of differentiating the different characters, right? I'm going to spend good money on good socks. <laughs> I'm going to buy wealthy socks. And, and who knows what that actually mechanical effect might be, but it can certainly come into the narrative, and it's a thing for the players to spend their money on and to feel maybe better about, even if they just weave it into their narrative, right? So that's cool, and I'm glad that they include that. But you have tools, food, drink, transportation, lodging, and then contraband as well. Great tables for all this stuff. Rules for reputation, that's another thing, of course, if you're going to be in a city, politics is going to be more important, faction play is going to be more important, and so there are rules given in this book for reputation. It's very simple, but it's it's a good, solid mechanism for reputation in faction play, and I like it a lot. I would probably use this, or maybe a variant of this, uh, if I were to run you know, a lot of faction play in a city, uh, because then there are also rules for gaining and losing reputation as well there. Hazards and disasters, because as you're traveling through the city, bad stuff is going to happen. That's one of the things that makes it very clear. Like, this city is not just like an ordinary city with factions. It's like, it's almost hellish or supernatural in that the city itself is a dangerous, unstable place. Um, it's sprawling, it spires, it goes down into the earth. It's, you know, it's, it's wondrous in one sense of that word. So you have hazards that are like unstable architecture, fire hazard, miasma, decay, spell residue, right? Traps even in the streets. <laughs> um, and so these things are gonna hit you and you're gonna have to deal with them or you know they're gonna go through the crowd and you're gonna have to react to it. There's some really interesting ones here. And, and you know, not just uh, you roll a d6 and then you roll a second d6 sometimes to see, or maybe a d3 to see what, uh, what the subtable is. The same thing, same thing with disasters, right? A burning block, bridge collapse, crumbling buildings, pollution, diseases or flood, and then catastrophes, right? an outbreak of something, a purge or something, a wildfire, undercity collapse, because the undercity is a big part of the game. So if it, you know, if the city falls into it, then it's going to be a big deal and what would happen there. Cobblestone changes. This is an interesting thing. So when you are, when something really bad happens to you, 
you can, you're considered devoured by the city, which is something changes about you. Uh, and so if you're mugged, for example, if that technical thing happens to you, then this can happen. Or if you're mortally wounded, you lose all your wealth. Whatever it might be, then you are changed by the city. There's a d20 table for that change, and they are really interesting, right? Uh, you get, uh, if you roll an 11, the most dangerous, dangerous game, an aristocrat and their murderous house have selected you to be their quarry. They send a jovial letter introducing themselves and formally declare their intent to hunt you for sport. They will not cease unless killed. So really bad stuff that can happen as a result of being devoured by the city. So you don't want to be mugged. You don't want to go a month without food or without, without lodging, I should say. You can't go a month without food. But a month without lodging, that sort of thing. And then cobblestone boon. So if you adapt, if you, if you resist, right? So you rob or trick an aristocrat. You pull off a daring or dangerous score. You gain the favor of a faction, whatever it might be. You get a boon as you adapt to city life. And that's really cool. Things like, 17, face in the crowd. Your visage and demeanor becomes unassuming and undetectable. When hiding, you can quickly and easily blend into crowds, vanishing from injudicious, injudicious sight. That's great. Really cool. Diseases, because of course the city is going to be full of diseases, and there are 20 diseases here, and they're all described, and how to cure them. I think they're really cool. Gross, but I think that's awesome. Like The unwinding is a really cool one. A body of thread, twisted and tight, strands finally free to drift into the ethereal night. An ailment that breaks the ability of the afflicted to exist on the physical plane. Transmission, powerful ambient magic or exposure to magically polluted areas. The effect, each day save versus magic or lose 1d6 to a random ability as your body begins to fade and visibly fray into wispy ethereal tatters. And the cure is a tonic made from a ground up lodestone and a week spent inside a ritual circle made of from salt, metal filings, and mortal bone meal. Creepy, but really cool. And the cure makes a lot of sense. So right? you gotta ground yourself back in reality. Salt lodestone, metal filings, bone. That's how you protect yourself from this ethereal unwinding. Super cool. Stuff like that is awesome and it's all throughout the book. We got another one of these uh, worm pieces. Cobblestone beasts. These are the creatures that live out in the streets, so it's a part of the monster manual. But the monster manual is broken up into districts. There's the general one here, and then there are specific ones for different districts later. There's the brick tick, the cobblestone crab, the court spider, Demons, and I like that they demons is, is a catch-all term for weird creatures that result from the kind of magical, weird existence of the city. So it's it's more like something out of like Ghibli or something like that, like the art picture. The, you know, you, you think of the creatures from like um, uh, God, Spirited Away or something like that, not just like actual demons. Uh, but that's really interesting. And you've got random appearances you can generate from these guys. Dire pigeons, I love that. There are some dire pigeons in castles in Tillin. Really funny. Fists of the city, the Kruksbriggen, really creepy hands, handworm things that drag you away. Garbage shamblers, masters of procession. Now, one thing that's very clear here is if you ran this entire book as written, you're like, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put my characters in there. You're basically putting them into like, I don't know, one of the cities in the Nine Hells or something. Like it is, it is horrifying and horrible, and there's just so many awful things. So probably. Most people aren't going to use everything in this book and just put it into a city. You certainly could, and but it would be like a horrific nightmare city. You could certainly do that if they travel to a different plane of existence, or if you just want your prime realm to be horrible and horrifying, then you could just run this book as written. But probably what a lot of people will do is take what they like from it and make that a feature of their city. Um, that's, that's what I would imagine. The Sut Filk. Uh, Sut Filk. They're really creepy. They're fog spirits that walk backwards towards you. And then when you see them from the front, they're warped and trying to drag you into the darkness and the fog. Really creepy. Uh, then you get, uh, you know, encounters and moods for each of the creatures, for each of these encounters possibly. And then to build a city, how to actually do it. Really cool uh, advice here. Why a city? Wealth as safety and risk. Reactive, not random dangers. There's great philosophy here about the differences that you, you uh, the different, in a way of approaching a city campaign as opposed to a standard one. Um, how to run the city and key points at the end of each of these chapters. Common goods and services are available quickly and conveniently. Danger is reactive and motivated. Wealth is tied to security and safety. Expensive areas are a danger to a character's wealth. So great little key points about you know, running this particular kind of city game. Creepy art there of one of the aristocrats. Faction relationships and a cool way of doing it with just a die drop table. So you just drop a bunch of t uh, dice and then you know how to do it. You know how to you know the factions, and you can roll on these tables for their relationships, the actual factions, those who follow them, and those who struggle. And then that's the, uh, the sort of breakdown, right? Who's in the middle, who's following, and who's struggling. A way of looking at the different, uh, you know, just factions and their relationships to each other. 
And here are some example factions. Uh, and uh, something you can roll on, you can choose, or you can just provide, you can use them straight up. Uh, there are the anarchists, who are kind of the good guys. I mean, and in a way, you think of the anarchists as the good guys because the city is basically evil, right? It's 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 evil, and, and all of the, the power structures in the city are basically evil. So it makes sense that the good guys would be the ones who want to destroy that. So anarchists, hence. You have the artists and different kinds of artists and what they want, and it's really interesting. The colleges, the crime syndicates, criminal gangs, cults, enforcers, grand guilds, high guilds, lesser guilds, local businesses, mage cabals, neighborhood watches, noble families, the occult circle, overlords, political parties, religious institutions. And then you can generate your city. So you roll it out and you see where the different districts are with the six mile scale, um, which is cool. You determine danger and then you can roll for that. Well, what are the dangers in between these districts or in the particular districts? And then you go down to the one mile scale and figure it out more particularly from there with tables for features and issues there, and then descriptions of each of those. So that's really cool. Good uh, you know, advice here and uh, guidance here for making your districts, your city actually more interesting and you're doing all that stuff. Generating a building, generating house block form forms and doing second stories and really cool D6 building rooms, uh, D6 atmospheres with sub tables on these atmospheres, all the way through infested a heap Hideouts, right, and the different kinds of uh, hideouts you can get. Suspicion and trouble, how to upgrade rooms in your hideout, and what it would cost and what it does as a result. Street generators, street name prefix, street suffix, uh, random streets that you can roll on. D66, roll D6 twice. And the NPC generator, it's only D20, but you also get appearance, manners, and quirk. And a shop generator, inside reputation and quirk. I search the body table. So lots and lots of great tables in this book, cobblestone treasures for, for running a random uh, campaign. Then you get the, basically the districts of the city. One of them, of course, is the Undercity. And that is an almost a different kind of game down here. Um, you still are in the city, but it's sewers and it's you know underground um, caverns and the, you know, danger and scarcity rather than sort of the opulence and risk of the streets. So you could run the Undercity as a very different kind of game. Um, and that's what it says here. As a referee or game master, the Undercity Undercrawl is run differently than a typical city or dungeon adventure and has these key points. Getting in, scarcity, wandering encounters, and a point crawl. Art that feels, again, more in tune with that sort of cartoonish look rather than the, the really... I mean, it's still bizarre, but again, it takes me more to like Ghibli or something like that. The Alley Whelps, which is kind of people down here. Uh, they're not really led, but you can play an Alley Whelp and, and be one of the people in the Undercity. Exploring it and generating it. Rules for how to make these lines and these sub subsections. and Just great. Great tables for all of that. Uh, D20 Undercity Landmarks. So you've got Abandoned Mine with some, some traps features. Uh, you've got Feeding Frenzy Finds. The Catch, uh, Cart Canyon, Chandelier Tunnels. Crooked Palace, the Drip, wonderful, wonderful places down here that you would want to uh, explore or you'd want to present to your players to explore. Really good. This whole book is awesome with great ideas. I especially like the Undercity. D12 general features and then Undercity encounters. There's a table for it and then particular things you can run into. The Waking Wall, the Lipodop. I think it's how you say that, Lipodop? The Sewer Walrus, the Grime Bender, Stilt Lurker. I'm not even going to try to say that. Uh, Newman Wicked, or Newman Witched. I think Wicked. Mutants. Undercity Goods and Services. They're going to be different here than up, up above. And Trinkets. Undercity Treasure. And then you get the Spires, which is, you know, the Undercity is down below, the Spires are up above. And this is where the nobility live. And it's the same idea. Uh, you build, uh, you know, but in the opposite direction, right? The just absolute wealth and hedonism and all this stuff. And then when you generate this part, of it, you're generating towers and bridges that connect. And I think that's really cool. Spires up into the sky. I've always loved that idea of going up into the spires of the city, uh, making a dungeon like that. That's really cool. <laughs> that's a really cool look, and you get the sense of, you know, it's not just these isolated towers because you have sub towers that come off them and you have bridges that connect them. You can have this dizzying, you know, non-Euclidean architecture. Um, because the city is a bizarre, magical place, and the the, uh, the aristocrats themselves are kind of like, you know, spirits, demigods. They're not really just like people. Uh, with the uh, random uh, tables, random, uh, I should say, uh, 
rooms for your towers. And then Spire Encounters, the short stat blocks, and then you get encounters and moods, and then particular creatures like the False Scion or the Noble themselves. Really interesting too is that the Nobles are made of wealth. They're made of, of, of magical metal and jewelry. And so when you kill them, if you kill them, because they're very hard to kill, you can like harvest them, right? So the, the sinew silk or the gilded veins or the diamond bones or ruby flesh heart worth a lot of money. Uh, and they each have objects of power and you can eat those and gain that same power. You can kind of become a noble if you're not careful. Um, and that's something that's one of the options is one of the sort of questions I guess the book presents is what if the nobles are just mortals who are trying to ascend, perhaps? Maybe they're not something different. The Vulpa Sphinx, and then what happens if you spot an aristocrat, and what their manner is like, what their garb is like, what their adornment is. Treasures you might find up here. Material, the adornment, and is it magic? And then you get the different districts. So again, Cultivist di District, which is sort of the Garden District, and it's uh, beautiful and corrupting, as much of the city is. And you've got the Emerald Court, the Million Strands, the Mulchwood Circle, and then you've got particular NPCs who live in this district that you can use. Cultivists' goods and services, cultivist artifacts, cultivist loot and trinkets, people and places, shop names, shop appearances, street names, street appearances. This is like a piece of art you might see in the world, right? Because it looks like the noble is super nice and friendly. Probably not. The Bloom, Ascension, I might even know how to say that. The Mask, Heron, Animated Urns, The Bird, and Furies, Cultivist Encounters. Then you get the Foundry District, which is, again, the same idea, but this is all machines and, and um, you know, crafting and stuff like that. You know, same, same ideas, though. You've got particular changes that can happen here to you after you live here. Boons uh, and uh, changes. NPCs, goods and services, artifacts and particular locations, trinkets, people, that sort of thing. And then creatures, the slag men, the boar eels, furnace cats. Great stuff, great stuff. I just absolutely, I love it. Archivist District, same idea, but, you know, we're talking about books and librarian knowledge, cartography, that sort of thing. More creatures there. One of these creatures I love, it's the Grimoire Mummy. It's such a good piece of art, and I love the idea here, right? So it's a, a mummy that's wrapped in magical texts and tomes from books. That's so cool, instead of the regular wrapping. I love that. Uh, Scuttle Imps, Stack Panthers, that's a really cool piece of art, too. Artifacts and spells for the for the city as a whole. You've got the Altar of the Worm, the Artister's Panacea, Crooked Canes, the Grifter's Deck, Morbid Ottoman, <laughs> the Rat Signal, Wax Eye Chair, and then Cobblestone Spells. Spells for this particular city. Chimney Cannon, Cinder Pup, Dubious Slip. You can tell, again, the tone is just not as dark. It's still dark, don't get me wrong, obviously. But it's not as dark as Into the Weird and Wild, which is, like, really often gruesome. The influence here is not quite that dark. A uh, hundred locations. Great locations. Um, Dust Coliseum, The Great Collapse, Jelly Spotter Bridge, Mushel's Tower, The San Jab, Three-Legged Market, Yellow Yard, a little menagerie there. That repeat of the art, but it's done in pink. Running a city, and just the brief rules for this and how to prepare, making your city, preparing city adventures, and then the total conversion of how to do it. Actually, so there's a world map art, or world map, not art, <laughs> what do you call that? Handout, I suppose, local map handout, price sheet handout, faction handouts, and then a time clock, which is really cool. You have a day counter and a week counter with notes. Each tick is one hour, and you just can go through it, tick it off. So you could print this off and tick it off you know, by hand, or you could use a PDF and just go through it. It's really interesting. I like that they include that. And then an index and additional reading at the end. One of the, the things, and I think this comes through really strongly throughout this book, is Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell by Susanna Clark. I think that is actually one very clear, but also Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky. I think you get that too. One of the, one of the, um, one of the elements of crime, of crime and Punishment is uh, the sort of feverish, nightmarish uh, reaction to the city that the main character has throughout. And I think that's definitely what this, like the city is, it very much feels like a nightmare or a fever dream or something like that. So I can see where that comes from. And then the end. So Into the Assassin Citadel is one of the best, if not the best, city 
supplement I've ever seen. I know there are others out there and I know there are some that people swear by, but this one is really, really good, especially if you do want that more nightmarish city. If you're gonna run a campaign in a city, um, you know, how do you make that city interesting? How do you make it feel unique to the players? How do you make it feel like a, a the site of a, of a campaign? Well, one of the ways of doing that is to make it dangerous and and make it like a dungeon itself, right? That you're really still kind of doing a dungeon crawl, just instead of in being in an enclosed space, you're in an open city. But you still can follow rules, you can still make the, the process of moving from one place to the next interesting. City here is not a downtime place, right? That's what this book does. It turns the city from a downtime place into a dungeon, basically, into the site of adventures by leaning into what makes dungeons interesting, you know, dangerous, uh, they're nightmarish, they're on the borders of reality. Well, it's like, what if the city was like that? Okay, well, then you take this book. So if you want that sort of dungeon converted into a city, then use this book. But again, it's not going to be for everybody, uh, but the tables are interesting and useful. I think you could use those uh, in almost any campaign, even if you weren't going to run this kind of city. And certainly there's a lot of inspiration here for factions and for villains and for things in the background. You can take the creatures from this book and use them in your game because they're basically system neutral. Anyway, I'll put a link below to where you can get it. I highly recommend it. Hope this has been interesting, guys, and I'll see you in another video.